So good to see all of you this morning, and uh, hopefully this part of the worship will be helpful to you, and maybe to understand what a lot of us see as a very difficult passage, and rightly so. Uh, if you turn to your book to Revelation 12, we're going to stay there the whole time, and we got some other passages, but I'm going to at least put them up on the screen. This past weekend, uh, me and Jason did a weekend study on the Revelation, um, just trying to give some clear explanations or easy explanations to how Christians can apply that book. And I thought it went very well, and some of you from Gardendale came, and we appreciate that. Uh, when we look at Revelation 12, it's really a passage that all Christians should know, and I would even say all Christians can understand. And the reason why is even though this is obviously a very metaphorical book, and there's certainly symbols we have to interpret, Every single one of us, probably here on a Sunday morning, we know the story of Revelation 12, but we know it as the life of Jesus. And being that we know the story of the life of Jesus, we can look at a chapter like Revelation 12, and we can figure out what these symbols and metaphors mean because we know the story of the life of Jesus. And that's what I'd like to do uh, this morning. Two reasons why I would want to study this is, one, is that it teaches a message that we can use the clear to explain the obscure. When we get to passages in the Bible and the New Testament that aren't very clear and seem kind of obscure, you know, what are our options when we get there? Well, sadly, I think most religious people take the option of, let's just make something up. You know, uh, I have something that sort of reminds me of this that I saw on TV. Let me say that that works with this. Oh, I saw something on the news that sort of has something to do with this. I'm going to go ahead and identify that symbol to be that. Well, that's kind of just shooting in the dark, isn't it? And when you're shooting in the dark, do you usually shoot what you're trying to shoot? No, you end up hurting somebody is what you end up doing. But instead, what we could do is use what we already know from the Bible to explain these obscure passages from the Bible. We can use clear passages to explain hard passages, and that's not shooting in the dark. That's making good understandings of what God wants us to do. Because even though Revelation is a hard book, it's still Scripture. And what does Paul say about Scripture? It's all inspired by God, and it's good, right? It's good for doctrine. And so Revelation is part of that. It's good for doctrine. It makes the man of God complete. And number two, this is great preparation for the Lord's Supper. Because Revelation 12 is going to tell us some things about the blood of Jesus that we didn't get from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John. And I'll get to make some of those applications as we approach closer to the end. Well, let's first read chapter 12. And let's just read the first 12 verses. Revelation 12, 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And his child and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that she should feed her there 1,260 days. And that's three and a half years. Verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell with them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short, or he has a short time. 
Uh, to pull out the story just up on the screen so we're all on the same page, what we see here first is a mother, right? And the mother is clothed with the sun and the moon, and she has a garland with 12 stars on her hand, hand, head. And the mother gives birth to the child, right? The child that we see was born to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And being that the child probably in your version is capitalized, you probably already know who the child is a representative of. Now, as she's trying to give birth to this child, lo and behold, this terrible dragon with seven heads and ten horns waits and tries to devour the child as soon as he's born, right? And and it's a scary situation, right? You know, this child is supposed to be something good that this good woman's going to have, but this evil dragon is going to try to eat him as soon as he's born. But God comes and saves the day, and certainly this part is not a metaphor. God comes in verse 6, and he comes and he takes the child up to his throne. He catches him up or ascends him to his throne, and then he protects the mother from the dragon for three and a half years. And then as we close in that last paragraph, we see Michael, Michael whom we know is the archangel from Jude, and Michael's able to defeat the dragon. And the brethren rejoice that Michael is able to defeat the dragon. And we see a significance there, especially in verse 11, that Michael and the brethren are able to overcome because of the blood of the lamb, right? And because of the blood of the lamb, the dragon is no longer allowed to make accusations of the brethren anymore. He's no longer to make accusations about God's people And for our spiritual connotation, that's going to end up being, I think, the most significant thing that we're going to pull out this morning from the chapter. So there's the story as we read it. Now, what do most Christians do when we read stories like this? Well, probably about 10% of y'all have already turned your brains off (laughs) and said, well, this one's not for me. (laughs) Well, don't throw it away like that. You know, again, going back to 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God meaning that even though that this is difficult and maybe this isn't what we like when we like to study the history of the apostles and Acts or study the history of Jesus and Matthew, this is still from God. And God is trying to communicate a thought to you and me and to the people that he originally wrote it to. So let's not turn our brains off. Let's just try to use the clear to explain these metaphors here. And that's what I'd like to do from this point forward. Let's use what we know about God's story to explain this story of metaphors. Well, we obviously see, number one, the child, who is the focus of the story. The child was almost devoured at birth, and he was caught up to God and his throne. Well, who must this child be? Can we use the clear to explain the obscure? Do y'all know any story of a child being killed or tried? someone tried to kill him right after birth? And I'm not talking about Moses. You know, we know the story of Jesus being at least under two and King Herod trying to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem to try to remove Jesus. Verse 13 of Matthew 2 says, Now when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you the word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there was until the death of Herod that an angel had to come to Joseph and say, Joseph, get Mary, get Jesus, and it's time to flee to Egypt because King Herod is after his life. And we know that Joseph successfully, because of the Lord, flees to Egypt and Jesus is saved from this terrible circumstance, right? So that fits pretty nicely with what we read here in Revelation 12, doesn't it? What about him being caught up to the throne of God? Do you know any clear scripture about the child being caught up to the throne of God? What about Acts chapter 1, where the end of Jesus' story, so, you know, Matthew 2 is the beginning of Jesus' story, and look at the end of Jesus' story. Verse 9, now when he had spoken these things, Jesus, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And if we read Hebrews 4 or we read Revelation 5, we know that he ascended to sit at the right hand of the throne of God, right? What did we get? We just got two verses out of chapter 12, didn't we? We got verse 5, and we see that the verse 5, that this is the child, he was caught up to the throne of God. What it seems to me is all of verse 5 right there is the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. It's the life of Jesus. So who's the child? 
The child must be Jesus. And what did we just do? We use the clear to explain the obscure. Does anyone think the child here is a modern president? Does anyone think the child here is uh, some political figure? I have no reason to believe those things, but I have every reason to believe that what God has already said is also true here in chapter 12 of Revelation. And this child obviously is a representative of Jesus in this story that's being told. Let's also do now the dragon, who should be the easiest person to identify because John tells us exactly who he is. In verse 9, John says, So the great dragon who was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The dragon is Satan. Who else could he be? He can't be anybody else because John was specific and clarified that this is Satan. And also something interesting that we get here that we sort of get in 2 Corinthians 11, but not really much of anywhere else, is that John here explains that the serpent of old, which is obviously the snake that talked to Eve in the garden, is Satan. And I know we all already kind of know that, but this is the moment where it's very clearly identified that that serpent that started this whole mess is the devil. It is Satan. And he's the one who tried to kill Jesus. We also learned that who's really behind here and trying to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem? Well, it's the work of Satan, isn't it? And we get that from Revelation 12. Now, let's maybe do the most difficult one. Who's that mother? Well, we, she's, she's clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. We see that she obviously gives birth to the Messiah. Well, who is the woman? Well, y'all that know the life story of Jesus, maybe our first answer is, well, it's Mary. And that's an acceptable answer from what we know. We do know Mary gave birth to the Messiah, right? But as we keep on reading Revelation 12, I tend to believe she's a little bit bigger than just Mary. But Mary is certainly part of it, right? And I get that not from the birth of the Messiah, but from that concept that she's clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. Do y'all remember back in Genesis 15? where Abraham gets the promises from God of what he's going to give them. Do you remember what God uses as a visual aid to explain to Abraham about how his descendants would be? Does he not take Abraham out to the sky, the night sky, and say, look at all the stars, so your descendants shall be? And if we went to Exodus 32, we would see that Moses says that this was significant, and it was something said to all of the patriarchs of Israel. Moses says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And to this land I have spoken, I will give your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. All three of the patriarchs received a promise from God that their children would be as the stars. Their descendants would be as the stars. And not only that, but if you can think to Genesis in another place, closer to the end. Is there a significant story about the sun and the moon and the stars? Maybe a guy with a fancy jacket had a dream about it. Y'all remember this story of Joseph. Joseph, in Genesis 37, told his brothers. Then he dreamed still another dream and told his brothers and said, look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And of us that know the story of Joseph, What do those sun, moon, and stars represent? Well, they represent the Hebrew people, the whole family of Jacob, or sometimes we would say the whole family of Israel. And what's interesting, and we're not going to do it today for time's sake, but there are many times from Genesis all the way to Daniel and into the minor prophets where the sun, moon, and stars are used to talk about faithful Israel that this is God's special people, and this is faithful Israel, and I'm going to say faithful because the way God preserves her and protects her at the end of this story, but this is God's people via Abraham. And of course, Mary is the significant part of that that actually births Jesus into the world. But did not all the women of Israel have a hand in having the Messiah and bringing him into the world? Certainly Mary did, but didn't Sarah also? Sarah had a hand in Jesus coming into the world. 
so did Rebecca, so did Leah, so did Rahab, so did Ruth, all these significant women, Bathsheba, they have a hand in bringing the Messiah into the world. And so especially looking at the sun, moon, and stars, I think the easiest explanation, if this is faithful Israel, doing their fulfilled promise, bringing the Messiah into the world. All right, let's do one more. But this isn't a symbol at all. It's Michael. We've seen Michael twice before in the Bible. And now here's the third and final time we see Michael. We see Michael the first time in Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel, an angel comes to Daniel to deliver him a message. And the angel comes and tells Daniel, sorry, Daniel, I'm late. I was hindered from the prince of Persia or the prince of the kingdom of Persia. He withstood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I've been left there with a large, there with the kings of Persia. That is the strangest passage in the entire Old Testament, and I cannot give you barely any explanation of it. But evidently, Daniel sees what's going on in the spiritual world. He just gets a little glimpse of it. And an angel comes to Daniel and says, sorry, I'm late. I was withheld from a prince. Now, the angel here being withheld from a prince and being that Michael then is called a chief prince in the next sentence, I do not think he is talking about a king's son with a sword. I don't think he's talking about the prince of Persia as if it was a human. I personally believe that he's talking about a principality like we see Paul and Peter use to talk about a spiritual being. And evidently, this spiritual being slowed him down. So he had to call in Michael for help. And evidently, Mike is what turned the tide. I'm sorry, I just called him Mike. Michael. Michael Click, I'm going to blame you for that, for putting that in my vernacular. I'll blame you too, Mike. Michael evidently turned the tide here and allowed this angel to come to Daniel. So we see him as at least an enforcer or a protector, right? The next time we see him is all the way in Jude 9. Jude says, yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Evidently, Satan wanted to do something with the body of Moses. We don't know what that was. But Michael came down and he handled it. And he handled it by telling the Satan that the Lord is going to rebuke you or the Lord rebuke you for what you're doing. And apparently that solved the problem. But again, we see Michael as an enforcer or a protector. And Michael handled here the body of Moses. Now, finally, we see Michael here starting in verse 7. Michael and his angels fighting Satan and his angels. And Michael prevailed. Michael was able to cast him away where he would no longer be able to accuse the brethren night and day. And in my mind, again, the significant part of Michael removing Satan is verse 11. The accuser has been removed because they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. That Michael was able to do what he was able to do here because of the blood of the lamb and its effect on the brethren. And now Michael's able to be victorious here. My understanding of this is that Michael was not able to be victorious here until the blood of the lamb had been provided, making Jesus' sacrifice the chief focal event of this chapter. That's what made all the difference. Blood has been shed, and it's been the blood of the lamb that has allowed Satan to be overcome by Michael and by all the brethren. And so there's our little IDs. Now that we've done the IDs, Let's talk about the significance of the story. And then the lesson will be yours. Significantly, the accuser can no longer accuse. And that was done by overcoming him with the blood of the lamb. If you read with me again in verse 10, he says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Right? So we have Satan here who's called the accuser, right? And by the way, I find it very interesting that the Hebrew word for accuser or the Hebrew word for prosecution is 
Satan. That, that's what his name means. He's the prosecutor. He's the accuser. What do we see here used to be Satan's old job? Satan's old job was to accuse the brethren before God day and night, all the time. He liked to sit there and he liked to make accusations. And being that you're a human, and I imagine that you've had some experience being a human, what would Satan be accusing you of? I think it's very obvious that he was accusing God's people of their sin. That they were in sin, right? And there's even little significant things like when God told David, David, I've put your sin away. Who had been the first person to go to God and argue, you can't do that. You can't just snap your fingers and say his sin's gone. His sin's still there. I can see it. Well, evidently, it would have been Satan, right? He would have had an accusation. Lord, you can't just snap your fingers and say sin's gone. If you're a judge and a righteous God, well, you can't just ignore evil things like that. That doesn't work. You can't do things like that right? Can you think of a significant Old Testament story where Satan had an accusation to make? I think this parallels really nicely with Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1 verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. You know, what is Satan doing here, we learn from Revelation 12? Satan's doing what he always did before the cross. He made accusations. And when you read Job 1, do you get under the opinion that I'm at that this accusation is not just against Job? Who is this accusation also against? It's also against God, in my opinion. That the argument that he's making to God is Job, yeah, he serves you. Yeah, Job, he obeys you, but he only obeys you, God, because you're unfair. You give him everything he wants, and because you give him everything that he wants, well, that's why he treats you so good, Lord. And that's an accusation against Job, but it's also an accusation against God. So what does God have to do? God's been challenged. And we know what happens when God gets challenged. People get hurt. And Job loses all the blessings that he had from God to see if he really loved God because God was good or he just loved God because God gave him nice things. And as we know as the story, Job proved God right, that he loved God because God was good and patient, not just because God gave him nice things. And Satan lost that argument. He lost that accusation. When I get Revelation 12 and I see that the accuser can't accuse anymore and I see passages like Job 1 where Satan has done this sort of thing, I think Romans 3 is the perfect pairing to explain these three passages together. Romans 3, Paul says in verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. And let me pause and we'll take these in breaks. Propitiation is just a, $5 word for appeasing God's wrath. That God demanded justice. But when propitiation was given, when payment was given, God's justice was satisfied. And so there was no need to enact a judgment. But to do this, it was to, next phrase, to demonstrate his righteousness, right? Because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. The end there, verse 25, is talking about Old Testament saints. That God was forgiving sins in the Old Testament, but he was able to forgive sins knowing in his foreknowledge that Jesus would later pay for those sins and be the propitiation for his wrath. Verse 26, we're going to say it a second time. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Twice here, he talks about the blood of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus is not to demonstrate our righteousness. The blood of Jesus is here to demonstrate God's righteousness. And let me use my own little metaphor to explain in my mind the way Romans 3 lives. You know, 
if we were in a courtroom and there was a judge, right, and there was a prosecution and there was a defense, and in this courtroom, we all know that the defense did it. The defense is guilty, right? He did it. And now there needs to be a punishment that fits the crime. Who's the one saying you must give a punishment to fit the crime to the judge? Well, it's the prosecution. That's the prosecution's job. The accuser stands there and says you must punish. You're the judge. That's your job. And he did it. We all know he did it, right? What if our judge, who knew the defense did it, what if our judge, however, loved the person that was the defense and he loved the person that was guilty and he said, you know what? Because I love you, I'm not going to punish you. What would we all be screaming in the streets? We would all be screaming, that's unfair. We would say the judge is corrupt. We would be saying the judge is evil. Why? Because this person did it and they got off the hook because the judge loved them. We would not allow that to happen in the American court system. People would riot over an event like that, right? Now, on the other hand, what if the judge heard that the defense did it, he knew he did it, and the judge sentenced him to the punishment that fit the crime? And the judge says, we know you did it. We all know you've done it. This is the punishment for the crime, and I'm going to deliver the punishment. You have to go to jail for 20 years. Would we all riot in the streets? No. We would think the judge did his job. We would say, oh, well, the judge is a just judge, right? He's righteous. So what's God's big dilemma? God's big dilemma is that he's the judge. And he wants to let us off. But if he lets us off, what is he? He's no longer righteous. So what's God's big solution for this terrible dilemma? His big solution is... Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. <laughs> this is a way that God can deliver the punishment and yet spare the defense. Who's the defense? You and me are the defense. And Jesus takes the punishment. He provides the propitiation so that now God can justify us, but also at the same time remain righteous, remain just. Now, who's the guy over here running his mouth saying it's not fair? It's the accuser. It's Satan. But the moment that Jesus takes on the punishment and the moment that Jesus provides the blood of the lamb, what does Michael, the cop in the court, (laughs) get to do? He gets to go throw the prosecution out the window. Because now the blood of the lamb has been shed and the defendants can now be justified and the Lord remain just. Isn't that powerful? And you know what? You only get that if you read Revelation 12. You're not going to get that from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And, And this is what's so wonderful about this book. It can explain some deeper things that we already know from other passages. And one more. As we end the chapter, we see that the devil's angry because he's been thrown out of the courtroom. Verse 13, it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman who had given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and a times and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might carry her to be carried away from the flood. But the earth opened the woman, open, the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The way Revelation 12 ends us with is that Satan knows he's been bested. Satan's now stuck on earth, no longer being able to make accusations. So what does he do? He just goes and tries to hurt all of God's people. I think Jeff May, 
He came and he prayed for us. He did a first prayer when Henderson preached that Sunday that Henderson was here. And I specifically remember what Jeff prayed for. Jeff said, Lord, help us all remember that we're warring against an angry devil. And I thought, that's Revelation 12. What's Satan's motivations now that he's been bested by Jesus? His motivation is wrath. He's angry. And he goes and he tries to make war with any of those that hold the testimony of Jesus Christ because he hates Jesus Christ. And certainly here, the woman and her offspring, I think there's a good argument we can make that these aren't just Christians, but Jewish Christians. But still, there's a connotation there that stands for all Christians, that he hates us because we've been saved by the testimony of Jesus Christ and because we keep his commandments. Well, are there any passages we can go to to deal with an angry devil? Well, we can go to this one, James 4. James says, therefore submit to God, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, even though now on earth we have to deal with an angry devil, are we with the lost? Are we helpless? The God that saved the child and took him up to the throne at the last moment is the same God that protects you and me. And if we'll just draw near to him and we'll resist the devil, what will the devil do? He'll flee from us like he's always flee from us. He'll flee from us just like he had to flee from Job. And what a great confidence we can have because we understand the things that Jesus has done for us, especially by using some of this metaphorical language in Revelation. Thank you for your close attention. And maybe that has at least opened up a book that can be hard just some clear doctrinal things we learn from other places. I think something as we as Christians struggle with often is guilt. We all know about the things we've done in our lives. Um, and no matter how hard we try, we can't forget about them. David tried to forget about his sin, right? And he said in the Psalms that it was like, God's hand was on his heart and he just couldn't forget it. We all struggle with guilt. And many of us that come to church and we're churchgoers, but we're not Christians, you struggle with guilt a lot, don't you? You know what you've done, you know? And, and you know from this connotation that Satan has every right to make an accusation against you. Well, what's the solution? The solution is overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. That's an easy solution on our part. He just takes obedience to the commandments of God. And Jesus has already done the heavy lifting. If there's anyone here that needs to be able to be overcome or to overcome with the blood of the Lamb, this is what this local congregation wants to assist you with. If there's anyone here we can spiritually assist, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing?